This tutorial will show you how to make a found object assemblage. You take objects that you find, assemble them, and then we will be using spray paint to create a cohesive look. I will show you step by step how to create this as well as some student examples from my own classroom. The supplies are very minimal and you can work with whatever glue, scissors, and X-Acto knives you have on hand. If you love learning about art, help this public school art teacher with her side hustle and hit that subscribe button. So the first step with this found object assemblage is assembling a box. And I stole this idea from my coworker. She teaches a sculpture class as well and she had her students create small cardboard boxes with shelves instead of doing it flat like a relief sculpture. These student examples are just done on a flat piece of cardboard. You could also use wood and click the link above to see that detailed lesson plan if you're not interested in creating a box. I'm going to be using my self-healing cutting mat, a ruler, an X-Acto knife, but you could do this with a pair of heavy duty scissors. I'm going to make my box very small and mine is going to be six inches by six inches square. My students did eight by eight, but I always kind of do a smaller practice one first just to make sure that the technique works and because I am lazy and don't want to waste time and materials, I usually work a little bit smaller. So although I am measuring out six inches by six inches, you could make this miniature even smaller. Uh, you could do it eight by eight like my students did or whatever size works for you. It also doesn't have to be a square. That's just what works best for my brain. Whenever you're cutting a material like fabric, wood, cardboard, always cut from the edges and then you only have to measure two sides instead of four. I'm using my X-Acto knife and you'll see that I'm using my ruler as a straight edge and so that the X-Acto knife uh, stays within the line. I'm going to cut both sides using the X-Acto knife. Again, I have had students use scissors for this. You could use a box cutter. Whatever you do, just be careful. It's an X-Acto blade and it will cut you just like it's cutting the cardboard. So cut away from yourself and always practice safety when using those materials. Now that we have the back of our box, we need to cut all four sides. And because it's a square, I will be measuring two inches by six inches so that I have four tabs that create the four edges of my box to make it three-dimensional. Having a plan going in is important. So you wanna know what measurements you're going to do before you kind of start cutting away. And I just randomly picked two inches. You could make it a deeper, um, more three-dimensional box and do maybe three inches. So just kind of play around. Luckily, cardboard is very inexpensive and it's readily available. So for my students, if they make a mistake um, or they have a hard time with measurements like I do, even simple ones, um, you can always just kind of cut more pieces. So I'm writing down six inches by two inches and a little trick, you can see I'm cutting that out. And again, I'm doing the principle where I line it up on edges I've already cut or the very edges of the box so that um, I don't have to do as many cuts. So I'm using my ruler as a straight edge so that my X-Acto knife doesn't move around and I'm cutting off that little flap on the other side. Um, and then I'm gonna use this six by two side and that's going to be my template, making sure it fits. And then I'm gonna take that and I'm going to trace it multiple times since I don't like to measure. Now, some of my students really are great at math. They love geometry. They love creating things that are perfect. That is not me. Uh, you're gonna see in this video, and you probably noticed when I was measuring my square that it was crooked. <laughs> it was not a perfect square. And I love my students who are so type A and everything has to line up perfectly. I wish I was more like that. Uh, but since I checked and this does fit, I'm just going to trace it on my smaller pieces of cardboard. Um, it'd be great if that would fit. Uh, I'm just using random scraps, but I will have to cut one more piece or trace one more piece to get that correct. And I know what you're thinking, those tabs are already crooked. I know, I know. I'm gonna speed this up twice the speed since I am using the same techniques to cut out my tabs. And again, I want four total. So right now I have three. Once I have these cut out and that small edge on the right hand side needs to be perfected, I'm gonna repeat my steps one more time. Let's go ahead and speed this up big time since you've seen me repeat my steps. Okay, so now you should have a six by six inch box, or again, whatever measurements you're using, and four six by two inch sides that I'm going to assemble to create my square box. 
since I know I'm using a really opaque spray paint, um, I'm using artist tape because everything's gonna be covered up. So if you're not using spray paint and you're painting this by hand, keep in mind um, what materials you use and how um, that will be affected by the paint you use at the very end. Uh, but the spray paint I use is just a very cheap, like $2 spray paint and it does a great job. Um, and the painter's tape is so easy to use. Basically I put it on the back side and I let it stick to half of the base and then half of the tab. So I'm gonna take the tab, line it up flush, uh, whichever side kind of fits the best, pressing it down flat, leaving a little bit of a crack so that it can then fold up. And then I'll join each seam using that painter's tape. So that's the technique I'm using. You could use glue. Um, hot glue is pretty easy to work with. Elmer's glue potentially would work. Um, it'd probably be a little bit more annoying. You could always do smaller pieces of tape and then fill in the gaps with glue. Um, masking tape would work. It really just depends on what you have on hand. Um, so I'm gonna repeat my step over here. I'm laying it underneath the box half under the box, half under the tab, lining it up so when I fold it, it should touch flush with all the edges, very nice. And then I'll fold the tape from there. I'm speeding things up again here and I have one more tab, uh, making sure it has the right fit using my tape and then I will kind of lay each flap down flat and then we'll go about reinforcing all the sides. So this is just kind of like step one, making sure everything fits. Um, and then once it's all attached, as you can see on the back like that, it's just a box that's completely open. Like if you've ever deconstructed your Amazon package. Um, and then I'm we'll reinforce my tape all the corners. And I'm folding each tab, um, making sure that everything connects and you can use as much tape as you would like. I tell my students, make sure it feels sturdy. If you pick it up and kind of shake it a little bit, that the, it doesn't move around, but it feels solid. It feels like it's completely attached and um, it takes as much tape as it takes. That's kind of the advice there. I really like to have tape, not just on the outside of the box, but I'm gonna go back through. And again, you can see down at the bottom, this is sped up double time. I'm gonna go back and reinforce every single seam that I did inside and out. And you see me with my X-Acto knife. I'm really bothered by the uneven tab I created. I always make problems for myself by just not measuring correctly the first time. I'm sure some of you can relate. And for some of you that's driving you crazy, I didn't cut it correct the first time. So um, art is all about problem solving. And I'm just going through and with my tape reinforcing every single time two boxes touch inside and out. Once you're satisfied that your box is secure and square, let's experiment with making some shelves. This is a great way to create dimension in your assemblage and I'm gonna be making small little shelves and cubbies to give my artwork a little bit more organization and some composition. So I'm just cutting another strip um, that goes all the way across. So again, this needs to, or at least I want it to fit inside the box. So it shouldn't exceed two inches um, in depth. And then I'm just gonna use my scissors to kind of trim it up and give it a nice shelf. Uh, rule of thirds is always kind of nice. Um, with art. So what I mean by that is instead of dividing things and having things right in the center or divided in half, I'm going to try and put it kind of a third of the way down. So I have like a one third section and a two third section that I can fill with my found objects later. I used uh, Elmer or not Elmer's. I use hot glue for this. Um, could have I used tape? Yes. Um, but I'm just playing around with different materials and seeing which ones work best. Um, they work great. So you could tape as some of my students have done. You can use Elmer's glue you just have to be patient for that to dry or hot glue just don't burn yourself um, what I'm doing now is I'm creating look at that crooked shelf I'm creating more dimensions within my spaces I don't want it to just be either like all the same depth back into the box so I'm building up this section down here with layers of flat cardboard um, and it's very subtle, but then that way there's a little bit more depth and dimension to this. This is a sculpture technique, so depth and three dimensions are always really important. And although this is flat and kind of has just like one viewpoint, it's not in the round or 360, thinking about depth when sculpting is a really important uh, practice to get into. And since I've done so many relief sculptures before, this comes really easy to me. And I'm just layering and stacking. To, um, and this 
this gives it more visual interest and it gives a place for my found objects to be organized, which we'll get to momentarily. Texture is also a really important element when creating a sculpture and cardboard boxes make an excellent texture if you just peel away some of those layers and when it's painted, you'll see what I mean uh, once we start adding paint. It just gives it a little bit more visual interest. So this is all about composition, the organization, the arrangement of the overall elements before we get into the nitty gritty of the found objects. So the more that I look at this, I just cannot stand how crooked this box is. What a teacher fail. Uh, slow down and do your measurements or else you'll be working harder to fix your mistakes. And so what I'm going to do is cut that corner that sticks out. You can see right there. I'm going to trim with my X-Acto knife carefully. I know it looks like I'm going fast. That's because I've sped up the speed of the video twice the time I was actually going. Um, and what I'm going to do is trim that so that it's not sticking out. So I'm just going to slice a little bit and then put it back. Not perfect, but much better. Um, another trick is thinking outside the box, literally, and creating depth by having pieces uh, that stick out or that create more dimension um, by putting like little shelves in areas um, outside the box, if that makes sense. So this little organic shape that I cut, and again, this has nothing to do with the theme of my work of art or the found objects I'm bringing in. It's just creating interest and dimensions with the box itself. So there's some really fun ways to make it a not just a box. Now my students are making this where they all work together and you'll see photos of that in the end. So just be mindful about that. If this is going to be a piece that works with other boxes, you don't want too much sticking off the edge, but a little bit really does give it more visual interest. Now for the fun part, once your box is constructed, it's time for found objects. And found objects are exactly what it sounds like, objects that you, the artist, find and use in a new way in your work of art. Um, I am collecting a lot of things from my kitchen. That's kind of the theme I'm going with. Uh, so I have plastic disposable cups, I have uh, milk jug lids, I have my protein powder scoop, I have my cat food container that is very cleaned out, and some random pieces of wood that I just have in my supply closet. So having a theme and a direction before you start is good advice. Now could you wing it and just see what happens? Of course, um, and some artists work really well in that way. Um, you could keep it very abstract, like artist Louise Nevelson, um, and she went around New York City collecting pieces of scrap wood uh, for the streets of New York. Her dad worked at I believe it was a furniture factory so that was kind of a theme you saw in her work assemblage artist Betty Saar goes to thrift stores and antique stores for some of her finds and Joseph Cornell works in a similar way right now I'm just playing around with these wood pieces I'm still not um, completely set on what my theme is it's probably gonna end up being things I find in my kitchen or like disposable food items um, because that's just something I interact with so when coming up with a theme or thinking about your objects don't overthink it ask yourself what are items that I encounter on a daily basis or items that I encounter in my life that are easy to find inexpensive and not valuable as far as like something you have to go out and buy buy. Sometimes students are like, oh, I don't have anything like that at home. And I'm like, did you use a straw today? Did you throw away something that could be rinsed out and used? So it could be as simple as like food waste. Um, you'll see me use a combination of hot glue, Elmer's glue. It really just depends on the objects that I'm using. And I'm really having fun with these wooden pieces. You can buy these at Blick Art Materials. Um, it's an art supply website. Um, and I'll put all my description or all of my materials in the description box below. If you have a wood shop at your school or at your home, uh, I know my husband has a garage full of wood scraps. That would be a great place to look. And again, if you're saying, oh, well, I don't have a wood shop in my house or at my school, um, go outside and collect pine cones and sticks and rocks and things like that and your theme could be nature. Now I'm playing around with my more um, important found objects. That little glass bottle you see there was vanilla that I made a cake with and kept the bottle. That is my milk frother that my cat knocked over and broke. And so again, things for my kitchen is kind of the theme uh, I'm going with here. Uh, how many straws have you used in your lifetime? I feel so guilty about straws these days. Um, you can see I have the lid to something. I don't even remember. Maybe it was my almond milk. Um, and that's something you can easily keep or lids to things or pop tabs from sodas. So what you see me doing here is basically organized chaos. I tell my students, you don't want it to look like a bunch of trash inside a box, which 
that is what it is. But remember, this is an assemblage or an assemblage if you're fancy. And you are assembling, you're organizing, you're arranging, you're using your artist's eye to pick out where the objects will go, how to use repetition, how to create emphasis, and how to not make it look like a bunch of junk that you've just glued together, or how do you make it look like you organized it in a purposeful way. I think this vanilla bottle is probably my most interesting or special found object. So I'm putting that in that like one third little area. Um, I think that's going to be maybe my area of emphasis. And emphasis is drawing in the viewer's eye to one area, making it stand out, making it more dominant. Another strategy is repetition with your organized chaos. So I have this straw and I am cutting it into smaller pieces to create a sense of unity through repetition. Um, when it's all painted, you'll kind of see what I mean. And this little area that sticks out and juts into the composition, I'm going to create a straw textured repetition moment. Um, so think about the things you have lots of. For me, I had several straws that I could cut into smaller pieces and you're making objects kind of become something new. I also think it'd make a great texture when painted. Um, I'm cutting these lids to create semicircles, and I'm trying to think foreground, middle ground, background. Like what's in the very back of my assemblage, what's kind of hanging out in the middle space, and then what's in front in those areas that kind of cut in front of the areas uh, that I've created with cardboard. So I thought this was a really cool shape. I think the circle kind of balances out all my straight lines and edges, and I'm on the fence about whether to paint it or just leave it clear. I saw one of my students hang down with string uh, some elements, so I tied a key uh, to this piece of twine and I have this kind of rod or this like cylindrical piece of wood uh, cutting through um, one of my sections of cardboard. I thought it'd be really fun to have something kind of dangle, like have movement to it. Um, so I'm gonna play around with that. It's a little big for this section. I wish this was like thinner or maybe a piece of wire, but I'm just gonna go with it. Um, and I'm gonna use the hot glue to secure that there. Um, and the key is not really something that I found in my kitchen, uh, but certainly I have keys in my kitchen at some point. So don't let interesting objects stop you from your theme if it doesn't fit perfectly, but it's visually interesting. It's okay to kind of play around with objects in that way too. So I think I found a place finally for this broken uh, milk frother. I wanna kind of hang it in the center on top of my plastic cup I got from Starbucks. And I like how it kind of gives me the vibe of like a pendulum or a clock. And my students were looking at a Joseph Cornell work of art that had lots of clocks in it. So maybe that is the inspiration I got. Um, but I just think this is a really fun um, place for it. I had a hard time gluing on top of that plastic. You'll see me kind of mess around with that a little bit. Um, and I think at this point, I'm ready to spray paint. It feels organized. I feel like there's a balance of depth. I feel like I have repetition. Um, I think I have at least two options for my area of emphasis, which I can always pick after I paint. And I can always spray paint it, add more objects, and paint again. We always spray paint outside and wearing a mask and gloves are usually the best. This is like a $2 spray paint high gloss that I got from Walmart. And you're gonna see it first, it's not covering everything. It's definitely gonna take a couple coats, especially depending on like what type of found objects you brought in. The surface of each object is going to react differently. So what I do is kind of spray, then I'm gonna do a second and maybe even a third coat. And don't forget to get your edges. I told my students not to spray spray paint the back just because I'm selfish and spray paint is expensive. So here it is after three coats of spray paint, um, very shiny, lots of fun details to look at. You can see how it being covered in paint just kind of transforms each object. Um, and I have a decision to make here. Do I leave it solid black like Louise Nevelson, or do I play around with some accent colors to create areas of emphasis? I love how my student used the tiniest bit of gold paint to make that key stand out in her sea of really interesting found objects. These students left a couple objects blank. So the giraffe that's hanging upside down and then the photograph and the Bob Ross pen were added later. Same thing with this example, the Eiffel Tower and the cheetah pen were attached after it was sprayed. And then the makeup example on the right hand side, she glued in the mirror and kissed it and then has lipstick that she added after spray painting.
These final two examples left lots of their objects not painted. So they assembled everything, arranged what they wanted to leave unpainted, spray painted it, and then let their objects speak for themselves. Many assemblage artists do a technique where the objects aren't painted at all and they're just the color they are. I think I'm gonna leave mine exactly as it is. Since I have another example on my channel of using metallic paint, I think I'm gonna leave this one solid black and call it finished. Thank you for sticking around and making art with me. And if you're interested in more tutorials, check these out. Find my Instagram at thatartteacher underscore Machado to see what my students are up to in my classroom. And if you're interested in full length lesson plans, like which assemblage artists we look at and more student examples, find my website, thatartteacher.com.